Revelation 3 To the angel of the church in Sardis write These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars So I'm not sure I mean this makes a little bit more sense the sevenfold spirit uh, I don't know if it makes more sense or not I don't know what it means to be a sevenfold spirit uh, or having the one who holds the seven spirits. Uh, so if anybody has any ideas on that, please share. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen. So, again, this is a message specifically to a specific group of people. The church in Sardis. Um... Uh, I think we can learn things and apply it to churches and uh, today, but I don't think it is meant to be uh, directly written to uh, churches today or people today. It was written specifically to an audience uh, in the first century in Sardis, but we can learn principles. We can gain principles from it. You know, a lot of times people think a church is alive just because of how big it is or how many people go there but they can be completely misguided then what remains and is about to die for i have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my god remember therefore what you have received and heard hold it fast and repent but if you do not wake up i will come like a thief and you will not know at what time i will come to you all right so this is another promise from jesus to come now this is specifically related to uh, the church in sardis he says i will come to you the church in sardis and i will uh, come like a thief now i don't think this is uh, like a global return of jesus to conquer the world or anything He's saying, Jesus is saying, if you, small group of people in one specific location, don't repent and change your ways, I will come to you and bring something to you that you don't like. So it's another type of coming. Uh, so I think most people, are, I think it is taught a lot that Jesus could only come twice. He came once in the first century. And they expect him to come only one other time. But Jesus, I believe, has all sorts of types of coming. And it can be in some sort of worldly judgment. Uh, and it certainly could have been uh, in 70 AD at the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white. They are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I don't know exactly what the problem was at the church at Sardis, but whoever's listening, I mean, those people at the Sardis church uh, would have certainly taken heed or had the opportunity or should have taken heed to this rebuke by Jesus. They were doing something wrong. They had a reputation for being alive. Maybe they had a lot of people, but they weren't doing things correctly uh, and they needed to repent. And verse 6 is another reference to the fact that this letter was meant to be read out loud to the churches and it was supposed to invoke repentance. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. So when each one of these uh, messages to the churches you have this introduction of Jesus and different phrases used to describe him. Uh, 
and all these introductions. So, but it's still describing the same person, Jesus. Jesus is holy and true, and he holds the key of David. Now, David was the best uh, Jewish king of all time. Uh, and he's saying, this is saying that Jesus holds the key to being the greatest king of all time. Uh, and I think, in fact, already was the greatest Jewish king of all time. Not just king of the Jews, but the king of Jews and Gentiles. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. So that's just a statement regarding his absolute sovereignty. Whatever Jesus wants to do, he can do. Whatever Jesus wants to stop, he can stop. There is nobody, no thing that can stand in his way. There is nothing that can change his plans, nothing that could overpower him. Whatever he wants to do, he does. Whatever he wants to stop, he stops. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. That's a harsh statement regarding the Jews. The synagogue of Satan. Uh, the synagogue of the Jews went from being the house of God to the synagogue of Satan after they rejected Jesus, their Messiah. When they rejected Jesus, and then they continued to uh, live the Jewish lifestyle in rejection of their own Messiah, who was promised to come at the specific time and do those specific things that fulfilled prophecy, when they rejected Jesus, they became the synagogue of Satan. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So listen to that. Uh, Jesus says, I will make those Jews fall down at Christians' feet and acknowledge that Jesus loves the Christians. The Jews and Gentiles mixed together uh, who hold fast to the confession that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was resurrected from the dead for the remission of sins and that he was the promised king of the Jews from the Old Covenant, Mosaic Law. That is a direct reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Jesus says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I loved you. The reason Jesus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple was to give his confirmation that, or the confirmation of the Christians, those who followed Jesus Christ and accept him as the Messiah. And he's wiping out the Jews so that they would acknowledge that Jesus loves and approves of the Christians. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. What? Oh. Since you Christians kept my command and endured patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, this certainly could have applied, and I think it does apply, to the Roman rule. Um, you know, back in Daniel, we know that the Eternal kingdom was to be established during the Roman Empire. Uh, and in Matthew chapter 24, in the Olivet Discourse, uh, Jesus gives specific instructions on how to escape Jerusalem uh, and the destruction that was coming on Jerusalem. So when you see these things happening, flee to the mountains. And he says, woe to anyone who is pregnant or nursing or whatever in those days because it will be harder for them to to get out but he promises to protect uh christians from the hour of trial it was meant to destroy jerusalem and the jews and the temple and that's what happened 
and those who believed in Jesus had the warnings to escape the hour of trial. Now, I think that also may mean something when it says hour of trial. And that just means a short period of time. This is not talking about the utter destruction of the earth uh, in time. It's talking about a temporary trial uh, that would test the inhabitants of the earth. Which I think is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I am coming soon. Now that means something. This Jesus says that he is coming soon immediately after he's talking about uh, protecting Christians from the hour of trial to test the inhabitants of the earth. He said, well, how long is, it, how long is that going to, or how far off is it, or when is this going to happen? Jesus says, I'm coming soon. And Jesus is the one who came to destroy Jerusalem. It wasn't just the Romans who did it. It was Jesus who did it. Because he... What he's absolutely sovereign. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so in the previous chapter, there was also uh, a mention of writing a new name or giving a new name, and only the one who gets that name will know what it is. So I don't think that name is simply Christian. I think that one was talking about uh, something more intimate than that. Uh, and Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Uh, and concerning the new Jerusalem. Now, this was written before Jerusalem was destroyed and before the Jews in the temple were destroyed in 70 A.D., uh, and so this new Jerusalem, they would have been expecting something soon to uh, happen to Jerusalem, to destroy it, and then to bring about a new one. And he says, this new Jerusalem, which is coming, which is coming down out of heaven from God. So God is bringing, in the process of bringing a new Jerusalem down from heaven. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. And it says, God is in the process of currently bringing down a new Jerusalem. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now who is that? That's Jesus. Jesus is... Alpha and Alpha and Omega, He is the Amen, the beginning and the end, the faithful and true witness. He came and lived the life on earth to uh, to live a perfect and sinless life, to bring knowledge and wisdom of the truth, and He is the King and ruler of all God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So apparently this Laodicean church uh, was comfortable in their riches and wealth, their physical 
riches and wealth. They didn't feel like they needed anything. They went to church because he's talking to a church. Uh, but they weren't living a life of faith. They weren't demonstrating faith by the by their heart and by their lives that that they live. They kind of just went to church. How many people today just go to church because it's expected of them or maybe because it's appropriate or maybe even because it helps them in their business dealings because they associate with people in their community that have businesses that can help them in their businesses. Uh, that's the kind of thing that is being talked about here, that they weren't motivated by righteousness and truth, but were motivated by money. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So here again, Jesus is saying, I, he said earlier, I come quickly. Where was that? I'm coming soon, verse 11. Oh, and here he's saying, I'm standing at the door knocking. All you got to do is open the door and I'll come in and eat with the person. Now, Jesus has said when he comes, he's going to destroy Jerusalem. Uh, there's going to, That God is currently bringing down a new Jerusalem out of heaven. Uh, and that Jesus, the other reference, Jesus said something like he was going to make the Jews acknowledge that Jesus loves the Christians. Uh, and this is a time statement. Again, over and over, we see that this is an imminent fulfillment, that it's coming soon, it's quickly, that's at the door. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So that's an interesting thought. You know, usually I think that a throne is meant for one person to sit on. Not two or three or thousands or millions. Um, but Jesus says he is sitting with his father on his throne. And he says that we who are victorious will have the right to sit with Jesus on his throne. So the throne of God is big enough for everybody. Uh, I have a hard time, I guess, going into too much detail with that because I have a hard time accepting that I would have an equal share with God on anything. I mean, God is king. Jesus is king, uh, Lord of all. And this idea of the Trinity is, is complicated, how you can have three persons and completely united in one. But then this paints for me an image of not just three in one, but maybe millions in one. Now, we are described, the church is described, as the body of Christ. And so, he is the head, and we are the body. That's one person. No matter how many people you have in the church, they all make one body. With one head. So, in Maybe in that sort of sense, if we are the body and he is the head, then of course we've got to sit on the same throne because we're one body. We sit on one throne as one, one person, not one body, but a body with a head. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, this was to be read to those churches and they were to heed the instructions and the rebukes and change their ways because obviously there is something coming that is imminent that's revelation chapter 3